China's special envoy, State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi, vowed again to make Chinese COVID-19 vaccines a global public good. He said at a special session of the United Nations General Assembly last Thursday that China is speeding up phase three clinical trials of its vaccine candidates and will offer them to developing countries when ready. How can the world work to ensure equal access to vaccines and what progress is being made by the COVAX Alliance, a program under the World Health Organization dedicated to this goal? And is there anything suspicious behind China's apparent generosity? Joining me from Shanghai is Professor Chen Hong from East China Normal University and here in Beijing, Ian Goodrun, Senior Editor from China Daily. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. So Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi specifically called for increased assistance to developing countries. He said all parties should provide more humanitarian assistance to vulnerable groups and increase investment in capacity building in such fields as public health and food security. He also called on the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund and other organizations to help alleviate pressure on developing countries. Um, Mr. Chen, why this particular message from China. Why did China emphasize the need of uh, the needs of developing countries when the situation of the virus in China has actually been largely under control? Yes, the uh, under you know the third world country or developing countries have uh, much you know underdeveloped conditions. In particular, the uh, infrastructure, including as we know the uh, medical facilities, you know conditions for storage, for distribution, and also other parts of the infrastructure that is actually being underdeveloped. That actually means, you know, for the, uh, those countries, you know, there is a lower capacity for, you know, uh, uh, aspects such as, you know, you know, ten, you know diagnosis and also uh, quarantine and also treatment. So that actually means that actually in those areas where, you know, living conditions, in particular infrastructure conditions, were actually lower, underdeveloped or underprivileged, you know, the uh, uh, infection rate might be, you know, higher. So at this time, as we know that actually the uh, viruses respects no borders, whether, you know, you are in, uh, uh, you know, the United States or in Indonesia or in Africa. So in that, that means actually in this particular time when China is actually, you know, advancing ahead in its combat against the virus, China has got this very favorable condition to help the uh, developing countries to combat the uh, disease and that's actually put us in a very important position that is actually to be able to combat, this, uh, combat the uh, spread of the virus at this very moment when the second wave of the virus is hitting uh, the United States and also Europe where actually the uh, developing countries is also facing a right. kind of new However, of the possibility yeah. of possible attack. However, China's intention has been under suspicion, under doubt, skepticism. Some people are saying China uh, is trying to win influence. China is trying to exercise some kind of a vaccine diplomacy. Uh, there is definitely something fishy or suspicious behind China's uh, intentions. So exactly what's propelling China to carry out, uh, to, to make its vaccines a global public good, of course, besides um, business transactions, normal business transactions. Ian, what is your take on China's uh, intentions? Is it business? Is it uh, dipl diplomatic or political influence? Is it both or is it national interests or common interests? How do you look at this? Well, it's interesting because the, the appellation of diplomacy is, is attached to any common object when it comes to China. So we had mass diplomacy a few months ago whenever China was delivering masks and PPE to people and, and medical diplomacy. But it's not diplomacy when other countries might do the same thing. It's just giving masks or giving vaccines or giving what have you. I think it's a very, it's a very odd kind of thing to, uh, to ascribe these motives when China is doing what many other countries are doing right now, trying to develop a vaccine, trying to get it approved and distributed as quickly as possible so that everyone, not just China, can get back to normal. Mm. And it's, it's interesting also because one of the reasons why China is emphasizing this a lot, I believe, is because in, when it comes to most of the wealthier countries, they've already ordered in advance most of the vaccines that are being developed in the West. So the mRNA vaccine that's being developed by multiple companies has already been pretty much ordered, mm. booked up. And so this is a way to make sure that nobody's falling to the back of the line, especially those places which, as was just said, are the most vulnerable and the most susceptible to being hit harder 
by a second wave or a third wave or a fourth wave or however many waves there might be. There might be one wave with a lot of ripples. We just don't know what might happen. Mm -hmm. So immunizing as many people as possible as fast as possible is the way to go. And How offering less expensive vaccines uh, is a way to do that. How do you look at China's, uh, what is propelling China's to do all this? I mean, to, to immunize, uh, you know, everybody around the world, of course, is, of course is to China's interest, but uh, why is China particularly emphasizing its, its intention to make it a public good? We don't really hear any other Western governments, for instance, so, so high, in such a high profile way highlight this, this um, idea. Ian. Well, the, well, there's a lot of good reasons for it. I mean, we can also look at, for example, the fact that China has had possibly, quite possibly, quite likely, in fact, the most successful non-vaccine intervention into the outbreak, meaning that, that the methods outside of a vaccination, the contact tracing, testing, mm -hmm. lockdowns, these things have proven very effective in China, as evidenced by people who live here. We, we experience it every day. People still wear masks, of course. China was the first to call for a mask mandate. Yeah. The, this was done not because it would uh, benefit them in some way. Of course, obviously, there's benefit to fewer people dying in your country. But, but it's, it's clear that despite the economic hit that China took in the first quarter of the year, that was a necessary sacrifice to protect and preserve human life. And so that idea, this motivation, can very easily be applied to immunizing the world. The very same motivation that led China to control the virus as effectively as it did. We see what happens when, when countries put profit ahead of human life, whenever they emphasize and, and, and attempt to minimize the economic damage by, by maximizing the so-called liberty and freedom that leads to a lack of control measures, a lack of the things that are necessary to keep the virus from spreading. So it seems to me that the domestic policy as far as the virus extends to the international and, and foreign policy. And so this is yet another extension of it. And you're correct mm. to point out that this is rhetoric that is not really being said by very many other heads of state mm. because of that motive at play. Hmm. Well, Indonesia's president uh, just uh, most recently thanked China for the arrival of uh, a Chinese-made vaccine. Um, 1.2 million doses of uh, this vaccine developed by China's Sinovac Biotech arrived late Sunday. President Joko Widodo said another 1.8 million doses are expected to arrive in early January and millions of other doses of uh, Sinovac vaccine are expected to arrive in the form of raw materials. Um, Professor Wiko uh, Joko Vidodo said, uh, we are very grateful. Thank God the vaccine is now available so that we can immediately curb the spread of uh, the COVID-19 disease. So um, according to Reuters in October that uh, the Chinese vaccine will cost around 13.6 uh, US dollars per dose and uh, the magazine Nature says ex uh, AstraZeneca's uh, vaccine will cost three to four US dollars per dose and will be available on a not-for-profit basis for the duration of the pandemic. Um, so, uh, Professor Chen, um, is 13.6 US dollar per dose an affordable price? How, how do we look at China's action on a bilateral level with countries around the world, in this case Indonesia, besides you know, what China is doing on a multilateral platform? Well, actually, in China, you know, at Jiaxing City, you know, the estimated price for one dose is uh, 30, 30 US dollars. So in other words, actually, the, the price offering to the uh, Indonesia, you know, a vaccine is already you know, lower than the price in, uh, that is uh, in China. In fact, as you should know that, actually, the uh, vaccine that is to be uh, you know, in use in Indonesia is actually, you know, you know, you know much, you know, uh, uh, efficacious one, especially in terms of refrigeration, because the uh, vaccine, which is uh, deactivated, you know, uh, the uh, in inactivated, you know, vaccine, which is, can be stored and also transported, uh, you know, at uh, the, uh, the, uh, the degree of, at the temperature of two to eight degrees. Celsius, which is actually much higher than what is required at the, for the AstraZeneca, you know, uh, vaccine, which is actually requiring you know a much lower temperature. In other words, in order to you know store and also to distribute the uh, Oxford, that is actually the AstraZeneca virus, uh, uh, the, the vaccine, you know, we need a much better or much you know so powerful you know freezer to uh, to be put in use. Indonesia is in the tropical. Area and also Indonesia is actually in a, a, a nation of 
uh, uh, the archipelagos, you know. In other words, the population is more dissipated, more, you know, in a kind of more, more dissipated way. And also infrastructure and also the population is actually more spread out. Yeah. That means actually it's quite difficult to ensure every location to have this high okay. degree of refrigeration for each of their freezers. So, so the Chinese vaccine, although it seems to be slightly more pricier, it's actually more accessible for populations in that particular area. And yet we do have this multilateral platform, which is uh, uh, part of the Access to COVID-19 tools or ACT Accelerator, co-led by the World Health Organization and this program called COVAX. By the way, 180 or 90 some countries and regions have already signed up to join this program, but the United States is the only country vocally rejecting this platform. So Ian, help us understand how does that work um, in terms of China's pledge to help make the vaccine a global public good and uh, um, what countries need to do to better utilize such a multilateral platform so that nobody is left behind? Well it essentially means that the wealthier countries uh, become self-sufficient in terms of the vaccination funding and they put money into a pot that will then go to fund vaccination and distribution efforts in countries that can't afford to self-sustain. To self so you've got countries like uh, Great Britain, you've got countries in the European Union that are putting in hundreds of millions of dollars. China has also made a, a very large contribution to that front um, and also pledging a certain amount of vaccine toward that effort so that there's no country being left out if a large country falters or is unable to, uh, to produce a vaccine then there's, there's that shortfall is made up for by other countries' vaccines and the funding that exists for the countries that can't afford to fund themselves. So this is a way of doing that. Uh, it's essentially a large money pool. Mm -hmm. I, just wanted to, I just wanted to point out one small thing. Um, the temperature difference, as, as was pointed out, uh, two to eight degrees for the deactivated vaccine. The temperature required for the mRNA vaccine that's being discussed is, is as low as negative 70 degrees Celsius. Hmm. So just to put a number to that difference. Okay, so it's uh, much more difficult to attain. Um, does the U.S. refusal to join the COVAX, COVAX program matter, Ian? Very briefly, please. Absolutely, yes. I mean, this is, the, this is the wealthiest country in the world. This is the country that should be making the greatest effort, putting in the largest amount of money. If we're talking about being fair here, which I think everybody agrees, we want to make sure that everybody gets a vaccination, and that does require money. And if the U.S. is refusing, that is a very, very high-profile snub, uh, essentially telling the rest of the world where they can stick it, and that's not an appropriate action to take in the middle of this global pandemic, especially when the U.S. leads the world in cases, infections, and deaths. Well, really a great pity that uh, the United States is in this isolation or retreatist mode when the world needs cooperation the most. Hopefully things will get better. Many thanks to Professor Chen Hong from East China Normal University and Ian Goodrun, Senior Editor with China Daily. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with Alex or follow me rather using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. I'll see you tomorrow at the same time.